When I was in a coma, I was experiencing very vivid hallucinations. I was in the desert. I wasn't able to drink in the real world. So I was trying to make sense out of what was going on. At my worst stage, my body was sucking calcium from my bones. The muscle was being eaten alive to generate energy for me to survive. Everything, all systems were in trouble. He had a ventilator that was breathing for him. He had blood pressure medications and he was on the verge of kidney failure. An especially aggressive superbug attacked Tom Patterson while he was touring Egypt with his wife, Stephanie, an infectious disease expert. We came to Luxor and had a wonderful dinner. I went to bed and I woke up violently ill. Tom proceeded to get more and more ill. He was delirious. He was having side effects from medications. He was in a lot of pain. When we called the travel insurance company to explain what was happening, they realized that he was getting worse and not better. They commissioned a Learjet to pick us up and to take us to Germany about three days later. Within 24 hours of arriving at the Frankfurt Clinic, they did an endoscopy inside his abdomen and they saw this giant abscess, a pseudocyst, the size of a football, infected with some kind of bacteria. And they took a culture when the results came back. Everyone was terrified. It was Acinetobacter vomanii. At first, three antibiotics worked, but after two weeks, none did. There was nothing left in our arsenal. Tom Patterson nearly died from bacteria so powerful that it survives attack from one of the strongest known antibiotics. No wonder such antibiotic-resistant bacteria have won the title superbugs. Superbugs know no boundaries. No one escapes them. Right now, they're thriving in India and China, but they're also present throughout the United States. Annually, 35,000 deaths in the US and 700,000 fatalities worldwide are low estimates because both US and world statistics are unreliable. For decades now, the pharmaceutical industry just hasn't produced enough new antibiotics, our main weapon against superbugs. It's a profit issue. So some would say meeting the superbug crisis is even more an economic problem than a scientific one. Not only does it take about 15 years of really hard work to develop a new antibiotic, it can cost as much as $2 billion or more. I am the ex-chair of an independent review on antimicrobial resistance, which I led for the then British Prime Minister, David Cameron. Antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistance are a massive global challenge. So they needed somebody that had a voice in this very complex changing world in which we are in. O'Neill's report lists 10 major ways to fight antibiotic resistance. This film focuses on solutions to superbugs. We owe our very lives to bacteria, and the vast majority of them keep us well. Microbes, especially bacteria, evolved to produce us. Bacterial cells outnumber human cells in our bodies. Some now say roughly two to one. 
They're vital to our health and to a healthy environment. Bacteria and other microbes make up our individual microbiomes. They're one-of-a-kind changing ecosystems. These microbes live with us everywhere, inside and out. They regulate our metabolism, affect our moods and thoughts, some think even our choice of friends and partners. Metaphorically, they're part of our DNA. Unbalance our microbiomes and we can get sick, and sick at heart. It's important to keep the bacteria that live on us or in our environment present and not try to destroy them at all, but really try to develop more targeted strategies to go after the bad bacteria that are really causing disease. How exactly do bacteria become resistant? One way is by rare random mutation that occurs when they divide. Most mutations will have no effect, but a very few will allow some bacteria to resist a particular antibiotic. Those remaining, still vulnerable to attack, will die, while the resistant survivors will reproduce quickly and in quantity. The more antibiotics in circulation, the more resistant mutations will occur. It's evolution's law of survival. To exist, at least a few bacteria must morph into true superbugs. And we're focusing on some of the world's most dangerous. A staph bacteria, MRSA, also known as MRSA. Multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis. A resistant strain of gonorrhea. A gut infection called C. diff. Superbugs, called CRs, resisting a whole subclass of antibiotics, the carbapenems. India is probably a global epicenter for antimicrobial resistance. I would imagine that every possible kind of major antimicrobial resistance threat exists in India at, at the current time. Antimicrobial resistance, AMR, includes all resistant microbes such as fungi, viruses and bacteria. We're focusing on ABR, antibacterial resistance. Bacteria are often confused with viruses. But viruses, about a hundred times smaller than bacteria, are particles, not cells. They can enter our cells, but aren't affected by antibiotics. When we wrongly insist that a doctor prescribe antibiotics for a viral infection, that gives bacteria more chances to become resistant. This is a huge problem. Doctors often relent to patient demands for antibiotics, whether appropriate or not. In the US, superbug infections have doubled over the last decade. In some countries, patients buy antibiotics without prescription. In 10 years, raising their use by 65%. Healthy people get infections. And the idea that resistance is a problem that develops over there, somewhere else, is really wrong. Anybody at any time can come down with one of these organisms. The rapid rise of superbugs is largely our own fault. Lured by miracle cures, we overused and misused antibiotics, experts say by 20 to 50 percent, stimulating bacteria's natural ability to become resistant. We unwittingly forced these bad guys to become medicine's terrorists. If we carry on doing nothing about it, by 2050, there could be 10 million, I emphasize 10 million people a year dying all over the world. And with it, the accumulated economic cost to the world economy between now and then would be a staggering $100 trillion. So enormous potential loss of life and mammoth lost economic opportunity. Without a doubt, antibiotics are the most 
powerful class of drug ever invented. They have the ability to take an infection that would have killed you and give you back 40, 50, 60, 70 years of life. I remember taking care of a young man with a, an acute bacterial pneumonia. He felt terrible, and it was remarkable how by dinner time he felt so much better in response to the antibiotics. I just, that story just always stuck with me. I really liked the power of what you could do with a good antibiotic. In World War II, penicillin was our first antibiotic used against staph and other bacteria. It seemed like a miracle drug, reliably killing this often lethal infection. We called it an antibiotic or life negator, and we learned how to negate them by discovering the chemicals they used in fighting each other. We stole those weapons, so to speak, giving them a taste of their own medicine. Basically, antibiotics work their magic in two ways, by killing bacteria outright or by curbing their growth or reproduction. So if we were to compare a broad spectrum antibiotic to a nuclear weapon, that would be not far off from what happens in the human intestines when you take such an agent. Fortunately, we've now developed specific antibiotics that, like precision bombing, take out certain superbugs. Other methods parallel how a surfer plays with nature by catching the force of a big wave at just the right spot. In the same way, scientists can now pinpoint superbugs' mechanisms and the surface locations where they rebuff antibiotics. This knowledge allows them to divert or even turn superbugs' own weaponry against them. Risky surgeries or premature infants, cancer chemotherapy, these things that we have come to, to rely on, all rely on antibiotics. If we lose those, as we are now because of, of antibiotic resistance, then perhaps we've lost modern medicine. So it takes about 15 years on average to get a new drug from its uh, initial discovery through the FDA and to pharmacy shelves. But it only takes two years on average for all newly introduced antibiotics to have significant clinical resistance arise to them. So this is what you call an unsustainable situation. Without a doubt, this is a crisis that we almost don't even begin to understand the proportions of. It's as if we've done massive ecological damage to the planet, to the microbiome of the planet, and we don't yet understand exactly how deep of a hole we're in. Vast unknown areas in both the cosmos and the microbial world are called dark matter. Of all microbes anywhere, we know only a tiny slice, maybe less than 1%. But culturing to discover the remaining 99% has become a faster job thanks to the new breakthrough isolation chip, or iChip. In the lab, petri dishes with man-made nutrients can only grow a limited range of known bacteria. But the iChip, with native soil nutrients in many compartments, now allows 50 to 60% of bacteria to survive, increasing the low odds of finding a useful antibiotic. The iChip, using earth from a grassy field in the state of Maine, yielded the first novel antibiotic in decades, Texabactin. Texobactin has not been tested in humans, but it does inhibit cell membrane growth in certain bacteria. Eventually, Texobactin may be able to treat several superbugs, like MRSA. MIT researchers, guided by our brain's own architecture, designed a computer-based model that swiftly sifted through more than 100 million compounds. 
In only days, this artificial intelligence tool found an unusually potent new antibiotic. It can kill 35 kinds of deadly bacteria, including three of the superbugs featured in this film. They named it Halicin, after Hal, the computer turned killer commander in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Halicin, now proven in the lab and in two different mouse models, might one day dramatically reverse antibiotics' decline by finding them much faster and more cheaply. But Halicin must yet run the gauntlet of more tests and clinical trials before it's ready for human use. We need a new drug, we need a new antibiotic to take care of these superbugs. The thing is, is we've had so many new antibiotics since Alexander Fleming first discovered penicillin in the 1930s. And each one's been met with the same fate, which is resistance, because each one has been overused, misused, abused. Sometime in the 1940s, shortly after antibiotics were actually introduced into human medicine, somebody figured out that if you give animals low doses of antibiotics the animals get larger faster and so it's a shortcut to a market ready animal so antibiotic use in, in food animal production in the united states is uh, not transparent at all and yet we still allow these drugs to be used in animals as trade secrets what we do have are rough numbers Fortunately, since 2017, antibiotics vital to human medicine are no longer legal as growth promoters in animals in the US. And in the last decade, antibiotic sales for US food producing animals have declined by 28%. Yet, an unknown percentage of antibiotics still remains in our food chain. And that's a massive driving force and forcing the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria in those animals that can then spread to people through the food supply, through the air, through contaminated water, through soil. Really big uh, retailers like Subway, like uh, Chick-fil-A, like McDonald's are coming out with these very progressive antibiotic use policies. The poultry industry is, is the first group to really start to change on a large scale. That's really been driven by the retailers putting pressure on the producers. The retailers are responding to their customer, which is us, right, the general public. The, the industry has a, a model that they don't think is broken, right, so they don't want to fix it. But from my perspective, it is broken because they're putting all of us at risk. The report card on fast food vendors is changing. Chipotle and Panera Bread now buy non-antibiotic fed beef. McDonald's is only average, yet plans to reduce antibiotics in its own beef by the end of 2020. By contrast, fruit and vegetable farmers use less than 1% of all antibiotics. And newly popular veggie burgers have only a fraction of that percent. But raising livestock with lots of antibiotics still remains a huge business worldwide. Animals that are raised organically are not supposed to be treated with antibiotics. If an animal becomes sick, it has to be treated with antibiotics, but then it has to be sold as, as something else, not organic. The Scandinavian countries are among the best when it comes to controlling antibiotic use in animals and in people. And Denmark, I think, is a great example because Denmark is actually a very large food animal producer. They compete with the United States as being one of the top pork exporters. The reason why Scandinavian countries stopped using antibiotics in animals had nothing to do with drug resistance. It had everything to do with uh, consumers finding out that the meat that they were eating had been raised with antibiotics. Unless similar consumer awareness uh, uh, blossoms in India as well, it's hard for producers to unilaterally go out there and try to take the antibiotics out because antibiotics happen to be a cheap substitute for hygiene and nutrition on farms. So unless consumers demand it, the producers are not going to change the way in which they raise animals.
So we see actually antibiotic use going up. Probably a large driver of that is that Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, these rapidly developing countries are adopting our methods of animal production to feed an increasing desire for that Western meat-centric diet. So India leads the world in consumption of antibiotics in humans. China leads the world in terms of consumption of antibiotics in animals. And if you consider the total amount of antibiotics that are used, whether in humans or animals, China is by far the biggest consumer of antibiotics in the world. Both countries are making an effort to deal with antimicrobial resistance because it is such a big threat. But uh, I would say they have a very long way to go still. They call it Arachibacter because so many of the uh, soldiers coming back from Iraq ended up with this particular infection. When Tom was sick in Frankfurt, I called back home to a colleague of mine, Dr. Chip Schooley, who's the head of infectious diseases. Chip knew Tom's situation and could tell that this infection, uh, Arachibacter, was likely to weaken him uh, to the point where he would be deathly ill. He said, here in San Diego, we're close to the VA hospital. We have more Arachibacter than we can shake a stick at. Tom came back not to the San Diego VA hospital, he came back to UCSD Health, which is our, uh, the university hospital here. Our infectious disease division does consultations in both hospitals. In focusing on solutions, we track five of the most dangerous superbugs. But before exploring these, we must consider the best solution of them all, prevention. The first line of defense is infection control and prevention. Clean food, good water that's safe, good sewage systems. The second line is to only use antibiotics when they're needed and not to waste them. This issue is called antibiotic stewardship. Let's not treat them as if they're a throwaway item. Let's treat them as if they're valuable. For years, hospitals relying too much on antibiotics have let sanitation standards slide. But now, Medicare has begun to fund hospitals by rank based on their infection and mortality data. In Europe in 2015, hospitals in Estonia and the Netherlands led in the superbug fight. Today in Amsterdam, Freie University's state-of-the-art medical center strictly rations its use of targeted antibiotics. This center also stresses a host of cutting-edge sanitizing methods. In the Netherlands, we have a very low prevalence of uh, highly resistant microorganisms. And uh, part of this is because we have very stringent infection control rules. For MRSA, for example, this center employs a screen and destroy policy. Uh, we also screen patients uh, at high risk that come from other uh, hospitals abroad, and we isolate these patients. Used mattresses undergo what this center calls a thorough dishwasher process. And of course, the staff must wear clean clothes every day. Despite its impressive package of high-tech tools, the center has found, surprise, that thorough hand washing is basic. Nurses who sometimes must wash their hands a hundred times per shift now use a new skin-friendly antiseptic. Rigorous high-tech cleaning, such as sterilizing UV light, kills most bacteria. But antibacterial soap, toothpaste, or hand sanitizers, though effective short-term, longer-term can stimulate resistance. Rapid diagnostic machines help bridge the gap between prevention and infection. Silicon Valley's Cepheid is a leading producer of such devices. Their breakthrough bacterial identification sets new norms for both fast and targeted antibiotic use. 
traditional methods often take two to three days. The gene expert allows us to take a specimen from a patient and look for the presence of microorganisms that can cause disease directly in that specimen using the nucleic acid of the organism as a target and to identify that organism in often 30 minutes or less. The beauty of the gene expert is really in its simplicity. You take a cartridge, you have your sample, you add it to the cartridge, close the lid, put it in the instrument, and in 30 minutes to an hour, you get your answer. It is so simple that it can be run by virtually anyone with a minimal amount of training, even in high burden developing countries. Cepheid's Expert Express test for easy rapid detection of the virus that causes COVID-19 has just received emergency use authorization from the FDA. In about 45 minutes, healthcare workers will be able to get results whether patients have symptoms or not. Getting Google for doctors or state-of-the-art diagnostics so that we can allow doctors to objectively have evidence as opposed to a very educated guess I think could be the single biggest game changer. When I arrived in San Diego, the focus was on my football-sized pseudocyst infected with Arachibacter. The doctor said, we have two choices. We can do surgery and remove this. But it would risk spilling this superbug into his bloodstream and he could die because there's no antibiotics to, to treat it. My infection was resistant to any antibiotic and Stephanie asked the doctors, is there some reason that you're pumping all these antibiotics into him? And they said, oh, that's just to make us feel better. January 19th, 2016 was the longest day of my life when this drain inside Tom's abdomen slipped and it spilled this arachibacter into his bloodstream. He went into septic shock. They had to put him on a respirator. They put him into a medically induced coma for several days so that he could gain strength but he never woke up from that. In fact, for the next two months, he started to slip away from us. It was clear that he was extremely ill, both chronically and acutely, and that it was gonna take quite a bit to get him back on his feet. My doctor friends said, we're doing all we can, but all of the modern miracles of medicine can't save him at this point. Tom's case was uh, unfortunately not a rare case. It's one we see way too often. During my experience of hallucinations, and this particular hallucination, I was a snake in a play documenting my own death. And at that moment, Stephanie asked me whether I wanted to live. And as a snake, I was able to curl my, my body around her hand, which took me a, a lot of effort. Even though he was in a coma, I thought maybe he could hear me. And I held his hand and I said, honey, I know that you're trying really, really hard to stay alive and that you're very tired. And if you want to fight, I'll look into alternative treatments because there's nothing that they can do to kill this thing. So if you can hear me and you want to live, please, please just squeeze my hand. And he squeezed my hand. Even more common than Tom Patterson's superbug is the staph infection, MRSA. Decades ago, it escaped from hospitals and clinics into the community at large, attacking anyone, anywhere. But athletes are often more vulnerable from their own scrapes and by using shared infected equipment. MRSA almost killed America's basketball star, Grant Hill. Denied again by Lou Robinson. Comes away with his third spot. Grant Hill, one for the Facebook, stuffing it home. Out of the blue, my my body started shaking. And so my wife came in, and I think she thought I was being dramatic. Eventually, she got a thermometer. She thought, this can't be right. So she got another thermometer. So I think she went through four or five of them, and they all kind of said, you know, 104.3, 104.5, 104.5, just in that sort of range. She drove me to the to the hospital. 
We actually went to the wrong hospital. <laughs> That's when even then I realized, okay, this is, this is more serious than I, even I thought. When I got to a room in intensive care, there were about 10 doctors around me. They had, they had to kind of strap my arms down because my body was shaking. I thought at that point that I was like, this is it. You know, this is, I'm checking out. You know, I'm, I'm about to die. Fortunately, Hill was treated with vancomycin, a last resort drug, and survived. I may not have always washed my hands before, <laughs> but I certainly do now. And um, I'm, like any parent, you're all overly concerned and constantly worried about your children. And so you try to reinforce that. And not just say it, but do it yourself, and then make them do it. Tori Kinnaman, a Brown University pre-med student and gymnast, had a different experience with MRSA. So then the pain just spread throughout my entire body. I was shaking uncontrollably. My otherwise very healthy 19-year-old student athlete who was never sick as a child was sick. I stayed by her side 24-7 through the whole thing. We were a team. <laughs> she, she slept in the hospital chair for a month right by my bed. Tori's treatment began in earnest after her mother pressed for an MRI. That scan and other tests showed Mercer to be deeply buried in Tori's thigh muscle. A 20-inch incision in Tori's thigh had to remain open for a series of eight surgeries. Tori recovered at home, but returned to Brown in her sophomore year, ready to avenge MRSA by studying its effects on young athletes. Dr. Milonakis, a physician researcher, took her into his lab. Our research focuses mostly on the treatment of MRSA and also uh, in the treatment of resistant infections. We're using a very different approach in our antimicrobial drug discovery. Worms react to bacterial infections much as we do. Milonakis quickly injects quantities of infected worms with many experimental compounds, testing thousands at once. Milonakis also studies insects' natural immunity to infection in high microbe environments. MRSA bacteria turn into persister cells by becoming inactive, but not dead. As if hibernating, they're insensitive to antibiotics. And persister cells are non-dividing cells. They can lie dormant in your body, perhaps in the tissue. Recently, Milonakis and his team have discovered a compound that's extremely effective against MRSA persister cells. So it can go and even kill those dormant cells that sometimes I have to treat for six or eight weeks. Milonakis and colleagues are developing synthetic compounds related to vitamin A for infiltrating persistent bacteria like MRSA. Multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis, or MDR-TB, mainly affects the lungs. 95% of these severe cases occur in low- and middle-income countries, especially among victims with weak immunity, like the HIV-infected. Examinations take place in negative pressure rooms, noisy with equipment that filters out airborne TB bacteria. And this is a very uh, smart bacteria. Uh, you get the infection, you won't feel ill, uh, you will be developing disease in your lungs, you will become infectious, and only after that, you will start having very slight symptoms. So by the time you are diagnosed, you have transmitted the infection to about 20 other people. So the bacteria doesn't care if you die because they now have other 20 hosts. Tuberculosis, 
doesn't care about political borders. If a region has high rates of tuberculosis, the rates of tuberculosis in San Diego and California will be higher than the rest for the U.S. Dr. Laniado's clinic is a referral center for drug-resistant TB patients from all over Mexico. We just finished a study here in new cases, and 3.9% of the new cases had NDR, which is extremely high. Like when they come here, we test them. Once we have the results, we have to tell the patient they have drug-resistant tuberculosis, and they will be have to be taking drugs for 18 to 24 months. I would say maybe 90% of them finish treatment, which is amazing because drugs are very toxic, many very um, uh, severe side effects. So treatment, if I have to de um, define it by one word, it will work, it, it's hell. Juanita, not her real name, lived through this hell. Juanita arrived at the Tijuana Clinic with MDR-TB. Constantly coughing, she had lost 15 kilos, over 30 pounds. She felt like she was going to die. She had injections and lots of pills. The side effects were terrible. Headaches, dizziness, vomiting. At most, she could only sleep four to five hours a day. Despite her grueling treatment over 18 months at the clinic, Winita is now well again. A new antibiotic, pretominid, used with two other drugs, now shortens MDR-TB treatment to only six months. Gonorrhea is now resistant to antibiotics in most parts of the world. In fact, uh, we're now back at the stage that we were in 1920, when we had practically no drugs to treat gonorrhea. It's actually the second most common sexually transmitted disease right behind chlamydia. And in the United States alone, there are over 350,000 cases. Antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea typically moves from Japan to Hawaii and then usually hits the West Coast. So California and the whole Western seaboard, including as well as British Columbia. It's only a matter of time before multidrug resistant gonorrhea hits our shores. Gonorrhea patients insist on total anonymity. Women, more often than men, may have no symptoms, but still be the unknowing and unsuspected carriers of this infection. Not long ago, Quebec reported that a 23-year-old heterosexual woman with no symptoms was found positive for MDR gonorrhea. Fortunately, two other drugs cured her. But if she'd not been tested and treated, her serial sex habits would have made her a highly infectious carrier to unsuspecting new partners. So I think the average citizen should get out there and be as honest with their provider as they can to get the screening test that they need. Happily, four new antibiotics that treat drug-resistant gonorrhea are in phase three clinical trials. Once at this last and largest testing phase, about half of all drugs get FDA approval. Gerald Wright's lab at McMaster University in Canada is also finding ways to restore existing antibiotics. He pairs new compounds, adjuvants, with existing antibiotics. Wright, a veteran antibiotic researcher, himself came down with a resistant bacterial gut infection on a trip to Europe. A broad-spectrum antibiotic turned out to be useless. He came close to septic shock, but once home and diagnosed with salmonella, he was saved by a 10-day treatment with a targeted antibiotic. Where I'm at, I actually have this salmonella in my lab. It's called Jerry Salmonella, and we use it to screen for new antibiotics and new antibiotic adjuvants. It's just one of our go-to strains because I really don't like salmonella. My lab is really interested in preserving our existing antibiotics. And one way to do that is to actually block resistance. All those great drugs that we've discovered over the last 60 years become usable again. 
Wright learned of a recently discovered resistant, metal-dependent enzyme in India called NDM1. This enzyme neutralizes the most important class of antibiotics we now have, including penicillin. So we went back to the same organisms that, that gave us our drugs and asked, can we find molecules that block NDM? And we found one. And that molecule is called aspergillomerazmine A, which we call AMA for short. What was the magic? NDM1 needs zinc. AMA picks the zinc out of the enzyme. It's an elegantly simple mechanism. Remove the zinc, antibiotic work. Very simple. Sorry. So now what we're trying to do is find you know, molecules that block all the other resistance mechanisms. The many antibiotics Schooley and his team tried on Tom Patterson did not work. But after Tom squeezed Stephanie's hand to say, yes, I want to live, she immediately began to research alternatives. And within an hour, I found phage therapy, bacteriophage therapy. What the heck is that? The US has used bacteriophages, phages for short, only on animals. But for decades, Eastern Europe and Russia have been treating humans with phages. After World War II, they continued phage research while the West focused on antibiotics. The Cold War cut most East-West scientific exchanges that have only recently resumed. So Patterson had to have a special green light from the FDA for his phage treatment. I've spent 35 years working with different types of viruses. The only difference here is that I would be giving viruses to people rather than trying to get rid of viruses. I saw it as a long shot initially, uh, as I began to think about some of the advances that had occurred over prior experiences with phage, I became convinced it was very worth a try. These are tiny viruses, a hundred times smaller than bacteria. Unlike bacteria, viruses really aren't alive. They're only alive in the presence of their host, in this case, a bacteria. So they can actually be inert for years or, or decades even, but when they come into contact with that bacteria, boom. It has like a rotor rooter like tail and the DNA from inside the head of the phage gets shot into the bacteria where it takes over the bacterial cell and turns it into a zombie and makes more of itself and so that the bacteria is no longer multiplying itself, it's making phage products. Then there's this kill step that the bacteria are now programmed to blow up and they burst hundreds of little phage babies into the body who in turn seek more bacteria to eat. Phages are very specific. They only kill that one kind of bacteria. And once they've done their job, they're excreted out into the environment. I found that these phages were not licensed by the Federal Drug Administration, so they were going to be considered experimental. Stephanie wrote to labs worldwide. I was also involved in trying to find sources of phage for him. The use of phage in Tom's case was personalized medicine. We worked with colleagues at Texas A&M and at the U.S. Navy to identify combinations of phage that we call cocktails that were uniquely active against Tom's organism. One thing that's really important to know about phages is that you need a whole cocktail, a group of phages of different kinds to administer at the same time. If you only have a single phage, the bacteria is going to become resistant just like that. Immediately before we first administered the phage therapy to Tom, I turned to Chip and said, hey, how do you know what dose to give Tom? And Chip turned to me and said, we don't. We're making this up as we go along. We were treating Tom with two phage cocktails around the clock and things were getting better. But two weeks in, Chip came to me and said, the Navy team has just informed us that the bacterial infection is now resistant to the phages. And I was crushed. But we could send the bacteria 
to the Navy and within 48 hours, they could generate a new phage cocktail that would be able to deliver the knockout punch. And it did. As the cocktail took effect, Patterson likened his returning memories to a string of Christmas lights turning on one after the other. It was magical coming out of this, but it did take weeks. Tom Patterson's case was an amazing one to learn about for the field of phage therapy and certainly a good outcome. Timothy Liu engineers or designs phages, if you will. Lou's lab adapts two ways of targeting superbugs more precisely than using phage cocktails. We can engineer these bacteriophages to produce enzymes that chew up the biofilm protective layer that these bacteria like to live in. Antibiotics can then finish the job. Lou's second approach uses CRISPR, a gene editing method. Enzymes cut out, add, or tweak the bacteria's resistance genes, like cutting and pasting words on a computer. No antibiotic needed. I'm quite optimistic that bacteriophage therapy will start making its way and into clinical practice over the next few years. Lou's research bridges antibiotic and non-traditional therapies. Non-traditional methods, preferred for avoiding antibiotics, can delay or even eliminate resistance. One non-traditional therapy is used against the gram-positive spore C. diff. C. diff can be fatal, especially for those 65 and older. C. diff spores are everywhere around us and in us. One to three percent of the healthy population is always carrying C. diff in their gut. Good bacteria keep it suppressed. But when antibiotics kill bad bugs, in Christie's case for breast cancer treatment, they can also kill beneficial bacteria. C. diff spores then seize their space. I absolutely lost a lot of weight. I lost probably 15 to 20 pounds. Um, no appetite whatsoever. It was easier not to eat because there was so much cramping involved and pain. Dr. Neil Stolman successfully treated Christy two or three times with antibiotics. But when he stopped, the infection came back. 20% of all C. diff patients respond in the same way Christy did. For such cases, Stolman and other doctors resurrected an ancient Chinese remedy. When animals and kids were fed poop, orally ingested fecal matter, they recovered. They call it Fecal Microbiota Transplant, or FMT. A healthy donor's fecal matter implanted into the patient's gut fills the space C. diff bacteria could occupy. The job's done by either a colonoscopy or by taking so-called poop capsules, or crapsules. 80 to 90% of patients recover. And now, over the last decade, it's really exploded. There are, there are at least 100 docs in this country currently doing so. There are thousands of patients that have been treated and reported in a very scientific way. I can't imagine if there wasn't a fecal transplant. I went through this experience the whole time, knocking on wood, wishing, hoping, you know, for good luck, because there really isn't any other solution out there. The biome is the problem. Forget giving another antibiotic to the patient. Let's actually fix the biome. A poop transfusion is the least elegant intervention in the world, but it just recognizes that it's the only intervention I currently have. Fecal transplants and crapsules may soon have competition. A new C. diff-targeted antibiotic is in a phase three trial. Ridinilazole stops C. diff cell division without the damage done by previous antibiotics to the patient's gut microbiome. Probiotics might be called another non-traditional therapy. Sold over the counter, these microbes help with some intestinal, vaginal, and urinary tract infections, among others. But probiotics are not yet clinically proven antidotes to superbugs. 
Tom Patterson's superbug was extensively drug resistant. Even calistin, a highly toxic antibiotic of last resort, hadn't worked. Why? His infection had picked up a new mobilized calistin resistant gene called MCR1. Superbugs with mobilized calistin resistance can exchange their DNA rapidly between each other and also across species, spreading resistance even faster than ever. In 2015, a team of Chinese, UK and US researchers discovered MCR1 on a pig farm near Shanghai, where calistin was regularly used. This gene jumped to humans and has now spread to five continents, more than 30 countries, and over half of the US. Patterson was saved only by a combination of antibiotics and a non-traditional therapy, phage cocktails. So that shows that phage therapy and antibiotic therapy can be used side by side. That's gonna make the pharmaceuticals companies very happy. Phages can work alone, but as in Patterson's case, their combination with antibiotics demands a flowing antibiotic pipeline, and that need means facing some hard facts. The business model for antibiotics is broken. There's no way for a company to legitimately make good money in this field. If they have a, a new antibiotic that's innovative, that's really a remarkable product, they can't sell it. It's required to remain on the shelf because public health requires that we save it for a rainy day. And that's what's happened since the 1980s in antibiotics. And as a result, the companies have moved on to something else. There's lots of other drug categories in which they can make a lot more money. Pharmaceutical companies are among the most profitable of all industries in the world and often reviled for price gouging. But with antibiotics, they have hemorrhaged money. Newer, higher priced drugs for chronic conditions are often prescribed for a lifetime. But normally, older, lower priced antibiotics are taken for only days, severely limiting profits. How do we force or entice pharmaceutical companies to get back into the game of antibiotic resistance? If you gave them a big reward, which would cover virtually all, if not more, than the necessary costs of the hard work of producing new antibiotics, perhaps that might do it. Besides rewards to subsidize new R&D, O'Neill's report proposes delinking antibiotic prices from the classic supply and demand model. Lower prices keep antibiotics affordable for everyone. Lower quantities limit resistance and ration them for the very ill, a need almost unique to antibiotics. Once the delinkage issue is accepted, we then need to, of course, focus on what is the right price. It can't really be left just to pharmaceutical companies. The World Health Organization is going to have to play a, a, a noisier, bolder role. Now, certain emerging countries, particularly those that are big with more than a billion people, like China and India, I'm pretty sure they're going to have a view themselves. When antimicrobial resistance went to the United Nations, it was only the fourth time ever that a health topic had been discussed by heads of state. Only the fourth time ever. That reflects the seriousness with which the political class takes antibiotic resistance. All 193 UN member states unanimously signed on to make two-year studies of the superbug crisis in their countries. UN assemblies can agree all sorts of things, but turning that into reality and dealing with the underlying issues, that is harder. The UN will reconvene again on antibiotic resistance to see whether all these countries have actually done what they said they were going to do. 
over a decade to solve all of it requires $40 billion, which is a huge amount of money on one level. But in the world in which I come from, which is a world of global finance, it's not that much. It's less than one-tenth of a percent of global GDP. As an old hedge fund of mine said when I explained this to him, $40 billion to save the loss of 100 trillion, he said that's a return of two and a half thousand percent. And he joked that even Warren Buffett would be proud of that. There are an entire industries to be built based on vaccines that stay ahead of drug resistant bacteria or paper thin materials. President Obama than stood up in the State of the Union. And you know, I gave a speech a which included a, a discussion of antibiotic resistance. Uh, those of us who've worked in the field for a long time almost fell out of our chairs. You know, it's an issue at the State of the Union speech. Following that, the U.S. government started a combating antibiotic resistant bacteria initiative, CARB or CARB. And a lot of things are flowing out of CARB, including the project that I lead for the U.S. government called CARB X. CARB X is fast building the world's largest and most scientifically diverse R&D effort in the battle against superbugs. Since its start in 2016, CARB-X, funded by leading Western governments and foundations, is supporting projects aimed at the most serious or urgent superbugs. And so we're, we're investing in a, in a broad portfolio of, of brand new traditional antibiotics, but from entirely new classes, as well as, as things that are very non-traditional that have never been approved by the FDA, uh, things like a microbiome or, or phage therapy as well. It's a numbers game. You have to have a lot of shots on goal to score in this field. And the earlier and the riskier and the more ambitious you are, the lower those chances get. Despite CARBEX and other grants, small startup companies that have brought new antibiotics to market have recently gone bankrupt. They simply can't get a return on their investment. So we need better financing plans. One funding idea is like a Netflix subscription. Because with, with Netflix, if you watch one show or, or binge for a whole week, it's the same price. You don't have to pay more if you watch more shows. So the idea behind the Netflix model for antibiotics would be that a country like the United States would pay a fee to the company. And if there's just no antibiotics used that year or 10,000 or 100,000 patients are treated, it's the same price. The company wins, uh, we win because we have access to the drug, and it simplifies the whole system. The UK government and its health arms have now introduced the Netflix subscription model to the top world economies, the G20. Meanwhile, a few remaining old hands in antibiotic discovery work on. GSK is an international pharmaceutical company. We're, we're committed to antibacterial R&D because we recognize there's a, a very high unmet medical need that needs to be addressed. The majority of those antibiotics that are on the industry pipeline, which is quite fragile, are all part of uh, public-private partnerships where they're getting funding from outside of the company to help share the cost and the risk of developing them. Yeah, I think the, the public play an enormous role in this problem. They really need to understand what's at stake, because if we create any new commercial models, it may need redirection of uh, public funds from one place uh, to the other. Do we have today enough global pharmaceutical companies f genuinely focused on antibiotic uh, drugs? Easy answer, no. I think you can probably count on less than those fingers how many pharmaceutical companies are genuinely serious about trying to produce more antibiotics. And somewhere along the line, somebody uh, within the industry or outside the industry is going to see the light.
As the late Nobel laureate Joshua Lederberg once said, it's our wits against their genes. Because every time we use an antibiotic, we're inviting increased resistance. Tom Patterson's extensively drug-resistant superbug exemplifies this rising danger. With a 50% death rate, no wonder these superbugs have been called the nightmare bacteria. Fortunately, there's a new antibiotic in a phase three trial that could eliminate this nightmare. The Food and Drug Administration had a public workshop focused on phage therapy. There, Tom's case was described as a paradigm shift in the field. Tom today is doing really, really well. He's uh, back at work, except he's uh, slimmed down about 100 pounds. He has not tried to go on the road promoting losing weight this way, but I think he's pleased about how things are going overall. At the University of California, San Diego, Robert Schooley and Stephanie Strathdee now co-direct a new center for phage research. Under the FDA's Compassionate Use Program, the center already gives people without other options, like Tom Patterson, access to phage therapy. You have ways as a, as a person, as a patient and as a consumer, to reduce your, your footprint of antibiotic use in the world. If you have a viral infection, don't go to the doctor and demand antibiotics because it's not appropriate. Antibiotics don't work to kill viruses. They only work to kill bacteria. There's many, many different solutions that are out there, but without research to conduct the trials that we need to have done, we're not going to be able to move ahead. This is not the sort of thing that you'll wake up tomorrow and you'll have news like, you know, the coronavirus from China that suddenly emerged, bacteria move more slowly. And so this is a problem that grows for years. One of the problems with antibiotic resistance is that we don't have people in orange jumpsuits going around on TV. That really triggers the flow of money. But we can fix this problem, the U.S. share of the cost, is about what we spend in the year on toilet paper. It's really an amazingly small amount of money. We need the political and people will to see it done. Resistant bacteria are here to stay, always evolving to thwart new antibiotics. So the question isn't beating superbugs, it's containing them. But containing them will happen only if we value antibiotics like the crown jewels of medicine that they truly are. We can solve this problem. There's, not a, there's no question about it. We're actually smart enough to do this. Right now, we have political mobilization. We have action at the UN level. We have significant money from key governments. And so, if we are not able to make significant progress in this issue with this level of mobilization, then shame on us. This is the moment for us to move this issue forward.